Good afternoon and welcome to this video and uh, I hope you have time enough to sit through it. I've got to confess that it's been a video I've been thinking about for some considerable time. I have um, in fact been insomniac over it. I spent all of last night having woke up, <coughs> woken up <coughs> at around 2.30 in the morning discovering that I was mulling over over and over and over and over again exactly what I wanted to say in this particular recording and it's the difficulty was not <clears throat> my uh, lack of things to say the difficulty was having far too much to say and in the process of doing that finding myself uh, at a loss as to where to begin originally this recording <clears throat> was supposed to be all about Trans-Exclusionary Radical fem Feminism, um, or if you prefer the acronym, TRF, TERF, and originally it was meant to be a critique taken from the viewpoint of myself uh, uh, and dealing with philosophical, political, ideological concepts therein. But I decided, after thinking about it for quite some while, that this probably wasn't a very good idea. Not, I would suggest, because there isn't plenty of meat on that subject, but because at the end of the day it is like a red rag to a bowl at the moment. The word TRF, TERF, has become so laden <coughs> with elements which are far beyond the whole business of its generalised meaning. It's almost impossible to actually use that word without automatically engaging in trench warfare over the particular aspects of its ideological position with regard to feminism and the processes by which transgender people fit into that whole process. And I thought to myself, this is not a battle that I can ever win, <clears throat> primarily because of the position I'm in as a transgender person. I do not have, for 50 years of my life, I do not have <coughs> a female history to fall back on. Therefore, I am always starting off that conversation from a weakened position, a position which at the end of the day I cannot hope to win because of the nature of my own experience. <coughs> this is not to devalue my, my experience. Excuse me if I have a drink. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, gin and tonic. This is not because I don't value my own personal experience, I certainly do. But because at the end of the day I end up dealing with the domain of thought and conceptualization, which at the end I will always be weaker than those who can, can claim a female history stemming from birth. So, my vision was then to try to approach this from some other point of view. And that's why I spent an awful lot of time thinking about it last night. Um, I eventually came to the idea that I had to make this personal. Uh, and personal in the sense that it was about one person's viewpoint as with, with, in opposition to my viewpoint. And those kind of positions are more located in a particular individual's ethos rather than me trying to generalize and create some sort of um, <coughs> ideological system or framework from which I can criticize something else. And, and for, fortunately or unfortunately I suppose this was presented through, to me through the work of a certain writer who has been firmly in the, in the, in the news at the, at the moment, uh, a certain Joanne Rowling, otherwise known when she writes as J.K. Rowling, or if you prefer Robert Galbraith, I'm not even going to go down the route of discussing the Robert Galbraith thing. There's far too much in the way of, of conspiracy theory related to all of that. But certainly with the case of Joanne Rowling, I get an opportunity to talk about one individual's opinions in reference to my own critique rather than an overgeneralization of the process. So that's where this is coming from, not as it was originally planned. You could say she presented me with an opportunity, which I didn't have before. Uh, so thank you, Joanne. Thank you for actually painting a target on yourself 
and enabling me to engage in all of this process as I'm as I am at the moment. The second issue is all about the, about who I'm speaking for here, or so what position I'm speaking from. Well, can I make it absolutely clear I'm not speaking from the point of view of any organisation, any system, any particular um, organised associated group or organised group of any sort. Not my employers, not anybody else. The, what you're getting right now these particular approaches that I'm going to take on board are all from me and me alone. I'm not even going to say that my wife um, sort of is represented here, though she's probably heard them all before in one way or another. I may, may agree, I've got probably, probably she does in some ways. I don't think what I'm going to say is particularly unusual. I just think it's interesting to take a point of view at this particular, at this particular stage in, in time. In order to to, uh, to consider this in in a way that is personalised rather than generalised. The third issue here is also about my particular position. You, I probably be aware that I'm a transgender person. Uh, yeah, you know that's pretty obvious. You can tell by my voice. Probably, you may be able to tell by my appearance. I hope not. I, I try my very best to be unassuming in society, uh, uh, and. Generally speaking, my experience of the past 12 years of being out is that I <clears throat> have very little issue with the world. I'm a teacher. I work in adult further and community education and sometimes in higher education. I have taught for 35 years around that and in the process of doing that, I've been involved in the educational process both from a, a practical, organisational and administrative and political point of view continuously during all that time and 12 years of it in my current persona as Beatrix Elizabeth Groves McDaniel and in the process of doing that generally speaking haven't had much of a problem in the sense that I rarely come, ac come across people who are outwardly trying to malign me or harass me or whatever. Maybe I'm a bit thick-skinned, maybe I just don't notice it, maybe it's all about the whole business of me being less than attentive to the issues concerned. But, you know, I'm not going to start picking fights where my imagination takes me. I only really want to, to, to make this point, the point about Joanne Rowling's issues because of the nature of the way in which she has presented them to me and given me the opportunity to respond. And not only that, but given me a a situation where I feel marginalised, frustrated, angry, insulted, and generally speaking, demeaned by what she's had to say. What she has had to say, we'll look at in a minute. But my particular feelings are about this are based upon the idea that I feel a certain degree of self-respect about myself, which I it's, it's has been hard won. I haven't gained this by being granted any privilege anywhere down the road, you know. I gave up what you might call white male privilege 12 years ago in 2008, and in the process of doing that, took on the role that I have now, which is a not, not a cisgender role. I don't have those sorts of you know, naturalized kind of um, benefits that cisgender people have. I've had to construct myself as, a, as I've gone along, and that's been hard work. It's been even hard work even greater hard work because of the issues of betrayal and disappointment I've had on a number of occasions in terms of the way in which people have treated me. Um, betrayal in the sense that when I first came out, the people who I trusted the most, partially, the partially my family, excuse me, that's my phone telling, telling the time, partially my family and partially also a lot of friends I used to have back in 2008, who are no longer around because of the fact that they deserted me. I felt shocked by that. I now know, and I'm more, more than a little aware, this is a very common thing with transgender people. When you come out, you can't really depend on your previous existence to stay with you in, 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 later, in later years. You have to reconstruct everything from the ground upwards. And that reconstruction is a tough, psychologically draining emotionally pressurized process. I suffer from depression and I keep telling myself 
is that very surprising considering what I've had to go through after all through all that time and I think that's very common I think that's very common certainly if you look at the evidence that that's been presented by researchers in the lives of trans people you start to realize how often this this has occurred but their, their rejection from by family and friends uh, during the process of their revealing of themselves to the world creates this framework in which reconstruction of the self becomes almost inevitable the tragedies involved in all of that are extreme in some respects and I feel a huge degree of sympathy with everybody who's gone through all of that because I've had some of it myself. It's very hard when the people who are closest to you suddenly decide they don't want to see you anymore, don't want to have, be having contact with you, don't want you around their house, don't want you to have any association with their children, don't want you anywhere near them, and won't even communicate with you anymore, even though you communicate, communicate with them. In the process of doing that, you start to learn a little bit about how the rest of the generic gendered world tends to operate and there it inculcates a huge degree of suspicion maybe even paranoia but certainly suspicion in you as you develop this suspicion that tomorrow someone is going to uh, betray you yet again because of the fact that you may act in a certain way be a certain way dress a certain way say something at the end of the day which they find not right in their judgment of you as a as a person. That constructed process therefore is full of stumbling blocks, full of issues which at the end are hard to take on board and the learning process is slow. I still think that, that I'm still going through that even now, learning a little bit more about myself all the time and in the process of, of doing that learning, the knocks that I have to take are quite hard. Never let it be said that because I'm, I appear the kind of cheerful person, and I often am in public, that uh, at the end there hasn't been a great degree of uh, problems to deal with in my life. So today is, recently has been a very difficult position because I feel betrayed yet again by Joanne Rowling. Years ago, when I first encountered her, it was in, in the in the, in the under the name J.K. Rowling, uh, when she was um, author of the Harry Potter books, and uh, I was fascinated by the whole Harry Potter phenomenon. Phenomenon when the books first came out, you know the idea of people queuing up at at, at, at news at uh, bookshops in order to buy the books as they were coming off out of the boxes from the publishers. That fascinated me. What a, what a wonderful thing that it must be to be an author who can write a book that's so popular. And when I read the Harry Potter stories, I started to realise how important they really were in terms of the way in which they spoke to people who are marginalised. Because Harry Potter, as a hero, is a bullied boy living with the Dursleys. He lives in a under the stairs, <laughs> in a cupboard, really. And at the end of the day, he feels himself to be totally at odds with the world in which he he lives as an orphan. His parents are dead. And who is he? He's nothing, really, at the end of the day. Certainly that's the way the Dursleys treat him. And then later on, he suddenly discovers, <coughs> by magic, that he's something special. He's, you're a wizard, Harry. And in the process of doing that, not only does he become a wizard, he becomes a heroic wizard, fighting wrong, saving his community, becoming something better than he can be, Evolving, developing, being a constructed person from this godforsaken little boy to begin with into this much more confident figure who knows who he is, wants to be, to be better than he is, and is doing it by hook or by crook, stubborn. And I think very great, the, you know, J.K. Rowling's stories were very strongly the kind of material that, that children, people, Adults like me, especially me, could identify with. I was going through something of a Harry Potter process. After all, I was, you know, this benighted guy trying to survive in an identity that really wasn't my own, that was given to me at birth, which I didn't really enjoy. I was totally confused about who, who he was supposed to be. And then later on, I suddenly become, suddenly realise, you're a woman, B. And before you know where you are, 
Hero heroism becomes part and parcel of my life. I suddenly discover I can actually make a change about myself. Tomorrow could be a better day in the same way that for Harry Potter and Hermione and Ron and Remus Lupin and Neville Longbottom and all the other characters that roll through J.K. Rowling's books. Notice the pun? Roll through J.K. Rowling's books illuminate themselves as they go and improve themselves as they go. So when the crisis, the final crisis and confrontation against evil occurs, they put themselves on the line. And, you know, that's a classic idea of the confrontation against the ills of the world. Selfishness and the destructiveness and the brutality that the world consists of. So, it's not surprising then that J.K. Rowling could end up as being a hero in, in real terms. She was, and she, she, up until very recently, I suppose remained so. Whenever I saw anything written about J.K. Rowling, up until very recently, I said, right on, woman, get on with it. Can, you know, you, you've done it good here. You've actually pre presented something which children and adults can identify with and which, at the end of the day, has been emphasised in other media since, particularly through the movies, of course, which have, have, have expanded the Harry Potter universe and made it something much more tangible than it was before through the work of Daniel Radcliffe and, and Emma Watson and, and so on and so forth. The issue is now be, has now been shattered because of her comments. Her comments which are detrimental to my confidence in her, which has been totally shattered and removed. The identification with myself as a person who could be better, in the same way that Harry Potter could be better, is removed because I start to realise what a fake that whole thing was. Joanne Rowling doesn't really believe any of that. If she did, she wouldn't have said what she said in, in public. She wouldn't have turned the heroism that she espoused in the books into feet of clay as she is in public. Hence I differentiate between J.K. Rowling, the author, and Joanne Rowling, the person who writes tweets and diatribes about the terrible things that transgender people are in the world and the terrible threat they pose to cisgender women. Now let me put it this way. <clears throat> Much of what she says is incredibly ill-informed. When she talks about us, me in particular, because I'm part of that system, being a threat to the whole business of safe, safe places for women, I, my immediate response is, where's the evidence? Where's the evidence that such a, such a thing is possible? And so far, I haven't seen any evidence. Seen any evidence from anybody. <clears throat> I've had plenty of anecdote. I've had plenty of, of, uh, uh, of stories which are third, fourth, fifth hand, but nothing in the way you could substantiate in terms of, oh my God, transgender people have done this to cisgender people in safe spaces that they have been that have been created specifically for cisgender women. That sort of falls at the first hurdle because of the lack of evidence. Not only that, because of the sense that it's presented all the time in a way that sets itself up as a straw man for people like me to come along to try to assault. Okay, let's move on. Let's accept then that we have a situation, for instance, where there should be places in society where cisgender women can be free from the influence of, and here I use the word, men. And as I've written elsewhere, I actually have some experience of this because when I was first teaching many, many years ago, I was involved in, in, in organisations that were, were, were concerned about women's education and the whole business of, of creating, as you might say, separate spaces where women could learn through the new opportunities for women courses and, and so on and so forth. And during that, during that period, there was a considerable degree of controversy about the way in which that process operated. And in the process of doing that, I learned an awful lot about women's education and the principles behind it. And I agreed. It's, this is the irony. I actually agree with the idea that it's necessary to have situations, not generic and total situations, but certainly situations in which women learn separately from men. Now, the principle behind which she, she criticises my involvement in those sorts of situations are that by my taking part, insinuating myself into situations such as that, 
And not just that, but other ones, such as refuges, changing rooms, toilets, the usual rigmarole that's been foisted on us in from various positions across the months. By doing that, what she's in fact doing is defining me as a man, even though I have put 12 years worth of effort in reconstructing myself in the same way, <laughs> here's the irony, in the same way her heroes do. I've spent my time doing that. I've just spent my time relearning what it's like to be a woman. I've spent my time reconstructing and revising my opinions and my work and my way of acting in such a way as I've become more and more integrated with the female domain. I do not have to call myself a woman, woman every day of the week. I don't have to go around with a badge saying, I am a woman all the time. You know, I'm quite happy to be referred to as someone who's transgender. And it, it, it's not an issue. I don't have to be absolutist about this. You know, I don't lose any sleep over the whole business of people referring to me as a transgender person. But I do find it quite abusive when someone tries to redefine me by my past. The irony of doing that is it's not even a particular feminist process to do so. There are so many feminist writers, and I've taught sessions on them on many occasions in the past, who would be at, in, at odds with the whole idea of redefining me as a man. Because their process of thinking about women, women is not the essentialist one as of men. Women are born that way and therefore forever are going to be that way. But effectively existential ones, such in the work of Simone, Simone de Beauvoir, you know, that women are not born but, but made. Or in the work of Judith Butler, or in the work of Donna Haraway, and I could go on. They're not alone. Those sorts of principles are clearly are not the ones that, that inform Joanne Rowling. Because at the end of the day, if she is keen on the idea of understanding exactly how feminist principles operate, then at least she should take some interest in those particular forms of analysis. She may not agree, but she should at least take an interest in them. I have no evidence to see that she has actually done so. So I end up being redefined by Joanne Rowling because of a potential threat for which she has no proof in which I actually find myself feeling abused, marginalised and highly betrayed again because of the nature of her own paranoid needs. And what are that paranoid needs? Well, the question in order to be able to work that one out is to work out exactly why now. Why is it that Joanne Rowling should want to write about the threat that I pose to women-only spaces and the threat I pose to the business of dissolving or erasing female identity. Why now? Well, you, know what? You, you could, I suppose, go through a whole process of eliminating the possible answers to that question. And I'll let you go and do that yourself. Because, but at the end of the day, the issue tends to be the pretty obvious one is that the governments across Europe, um, certainly in the UK, have started to consider the business of self Self-identification, self-recognition is part of the legal framework for transgender people in the UK. That effectively means, at the end of the day, I don't, we don't have to go through the fraught, disgusting and stigmatising process of legalised, le legal proof and exercising a certain degree of, of apprenticeship in order to be recognised for who I am. And uh, I think, at the end of the day, that doesn't discount the whole idea of me learning about being me, and progressing, processively learning about being me, but it certainly doesn't mean that I have to spend my time proving it in law. And getting the government and the legal system out of my identity strikes me as the kind of thing that most women would approve of. After all, that's what they would want, surely, isn't it? So would men. But it's not good enough, because at the end of the day, the very idea that somehow I may be able to self-declare who I am without necessarily having to go through extreme situations of, of legal degree pokery, isn't sufficient for Joanne. She doesn't want that to happen. She feels that's a threat because she has this feeling somewhere where it comes from. I'm not sure it may come from the abuse she's had from men. I'm not sure about that. I have no idea in reality. But it comes from somewhere which says that because I might do that, that there may be lots of other men who want to put on frocks and makeup and then turn up at women-only spaces and use that as an excuse to abuse women. Well, let me tell you something. If there was evidence of that, I'd go along with it. 
I've often said that, there isn't any. I have yet to find any evidence of any substantiality in order to support that particular assertion. But even if there were, as I mentioned on, on, on Facebook not that long ago, to blacken an entire community based on something that potentially one or two of its members might do is absurd. It's the same absurdity that says, because of Myra Hindley, we're going to blacken every single woman in the world as a potential child murderer. It doesn't work that way. Minorities do not form the sample upon which you judge majorities. Similarly, the fact that even if you get one transgender person who might be a sexual pervert and might, might have abused women doesn't blacken everybody who wants to be trans any more than the same thing might apply to gay men or it might apply to lesbians or it might apply to black people. Just because there may be black criminals doesn't mean to say that every single black person automatically becomes suspiciously a criminal and therefore needs to be abused and murdered by police any more than a transgender person can be tarred with the brush of being a possible abuser simply because there could potentially be one individual or two individuals who might be, um, you know, bad apples in the entire apple cart. But as I said earlier on, I, even if I concede that, I still have no evidence to show this has ever happened or could, could even happen. Certainly in countries around the world where there is already self-declaration or where the uh, this, the situations with regard to um, uh, uh, transgender recognition is far more liberal than it is here. There isn't any evidence to show that suddenly we've got a spurt on of, of rape, murder, abuse, uh, sexual molestation and so on from men who've decided suddenly to start pretending that they're transgender people. It doesn't happen. So it's a red herring. It's a red herring before we even start. But it's a difficult red herring to get rid of and it smells everywhere. It smells because it's an easy one to produce in public because it seems logical. It seems logical to prey on extreme situations in order to deny other people their rights. And I didn't expect an author of the caliber and seeming sensitivity of J.K. Rowling to be the kind of person who could make that kind of assertion you could make the kind of assertion that disparages me. Not just me, but if you're a transgender person and listening to this, disparaging you as well. You may love her books, and I'm not stopping you from loving her books and continue to love her books and rereading them, or going out and buying them if you haven't read them. I'm going to, you know, I'm mean, far be it for me to do that. You know, the, the, art, the work of an artist and, the, and their, their opinions as individuals sometimes can be separated out in the historical calendar. Just look at the work of, of you know, Richard Wagner, you get a clear idea about how that particular situation works. But at the end of the day, I do feel very betrayed because at the end of the day, I did invest some sort of emotional commitment to the idea that maybe there was this person who could have a sympathetic view of a person who's trying extraordinarily hard to fit into a world which rejects her and has rejected her. Joanne Rowling, you have let us all down. Not just your colleagues who you worked with in terms of the movies, not just Emma <coughs> and, and Daniel and Ron. <laughs> not just all those people you've let me down you've also let your young readers down who maybe at the end of the day are potentially the transgender people of the future who have read the books think you're sympathetic and at the end of the day have discovered that you're not what does that say about them what does that say about you I think I've made enough of a case this has been hard fought, difficult. I've lost sleep over it. You know, hours of sleep over this. I've tried very hard to restrain myself from becoming offensive. I would love to swear, because that's what I feel like. I've felt extremely unhappy today and very lonely because of the nature of what has happened. It's like 
your best friend has died and you discover suddenly that they've hated you all along. That's what it feels like. Imagine it. Imagine if it happened. You're not transgender. Imagine you're a cisgender person and you, that happens to you. Imagine how you would feel. And that's what it feels like to me. Thank you for listening. I, I you know, it's I ranted on enough. Um, hopefully this helps. I, I originally thought about writing stuff and then realized that my friend and colleague Sophie Grace Chapel has done a far better job of writing it, writing about it than I ever could. So I refer you to her recent open letter about J.K. Rowling, Joanne Rowling, and and her her recent um, uh, pronouncements. If you want more detail and, and a more, you know, a literary analysis of the whole process, what I wanted to do was to talk about it because at the end of the day, that's what I do for a living. I talk about things. Thank you for listening. <laughs>